Can you hear me? You can hear me at the back? They are ignoring me, but it could be they're just waiting for you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Sarah McNally. Thank you so much for coming to this event tonight. It is our first event in six months at the bookstore, and it is very exciting for it to be this one. Um, Sahila Abdullulai is an excellent, excellent old friend of mine. She was a bookseller briefly at the bookstore 15 years ago, and so she's been one of my best friends ever since. And she wrote a book called What We Talk About When We Talk About Rape, which has been translated into seven languages and is one of the more uplifting books on rape you're going to read in your life. And then Chanel Miller hardly even needs an introduction. She's, she kind of took the world by storm with her memoir, huge bestseller, National Book Critics Circle, award winner in autobiography. And um, when Sahila came to me and said that they wanted to have a conversation in person, an intimate conversation in person about rape, it seemed almost insane in the middle of quarantine, but somehow we've made it happen. And thank you all so much for coming here and making it a reality. And without further ado, here they are. So here we are, that's the title of our evening and I have to say that it's very serious and our books are very serious but right now it's just so exciting to be together with all these people that I feel like we should just have cocktails and dance. <laughs> so I just want to keep, keep that mood. Um, so Chanel and I had actually both read each other's books before we ever met and in fact she's in my book from the time when she was still Emily Doe. And then when we finally met in March on a park bench, we kind of couldn't stop talking and then decided that we wanted to continue it in public because for me, it was really fascinating to meet someone. We've, we've both done tons of events all over the world, but I've never had an event like this where I'm kind of without a moderator, with an equal somebody else who has a story of survival and a story of using her craft to get through it. So it's just really thrilling and we found that we have many things in common and many things not in common, but we just wanted to continue the conversation yep. yes. in front of you. And what we, we have a sort of loose program and, and first we're each going to talk and just give a little introduction to our book and the timeline for those who might not know it. Uh, then uh, Chanel is going to, then Chanel is going to read from my book. We decided since we like each other's book so much, we're basically just going to have a love fest. So she's going to read from my book and talk about what, why she picked the things she picked. Then I'm going to read from her book and talk about what I liked and why. And then we're going to chat a bit. And then at about 6.30 in about half an hour, we'll open it up for questions. And so hopefully you'll have questions. And if you don't, we'll just keep chatting. We have plenty of questions for each other. So here's Chanel. Hello, everybody. My name is Chanel Miller. I'm so happy to be here with you, Sohaila. Thank you, everyone, Yvonne and Sarah, from the bookstore around the corner, uh, for having us here. Um, many of you are already familiar with my story in January. I'll give you the little bullet points. January of 2015, I was assaulted at Stanford University. That was almost six years ago. I underwent a year and a half long uh, court proceedings that led me to do a trial, which led me to a guilty verdict. My assailant was convicted of three felonies and served three months in county jail. I wrote a victim impact statement that went viral, thanks to many of you, and then I was offered a book deal. And many people ask why I wanted to write at that time, sort of like why go back into the story when you would just come out of the court proceedings, and my answer to that is because as a writer, you sort of get to become God for a little bit, and all of the people who you fear become your little characters, and you get to puppet them around. You get to decide how much space they take up and how long they get to speak in your book and when they exit the scene. And that was actually very helpful for me to experience. Another thing I talk a lot about is how these stories, I don't think they're too much to talk about. I think the context needs to be right in order for them to be talked about. And I think writing is actually a very healthy context to experience these stories. 
And so it's not the stories themselves that are too much, it's the context of the stories that we need to make nourishing and healthy to revisit these hard things. Um, and then lastly, I wrote because I feel like we prepare a lot of young women um, by advising them to do self-defense courses um, and how to protect themselves physically. And I think a lot about how writing is a form of self-defense. And if you can teach other people to hone their voice and really stand by their stories, then they will be able to protect themselves and fight for themselves. Um, and that's sort of what I want to help other young women continue to do. And there's so many gnats, and I don't know if you can see them. Can you see them? Oh my God. hovering over everybody's head. It's the patriarchy. <laughs> Um, so my story is that I was a gang rape when I was 17 years old in India and, a cop, and at that time and up to recently nobody in India had ever spoken out in public about being raped. So I had written a, a, a small little article in a women's magazine when I was 20 years old about just kind of saying this happened to me, I'm not ashamed, I don't deserve to be dead. And that kind of died because unlike Chanel, my whole thing wasn't played out on the internet. That was a different generation. Then many years later, I was outed again when there was a famous, there was a notorious rape and murder in India. And at that time, I, it was kind of like, like you, where I wrote a small thing. I wrote an article for the New York Times, an op-ed that went viral. And that five years later led to my writing my book. And my book is not a memoir, though it is a personal book. So I spoke to survivors all over the world about it and I I feel like our books are so different but there's we both tried really hard to make a point that and the, both the points are related because the, they show that that we're all wrong when we think about rape like Chanel had to work really hard to convince people that what happened to her was a big deal which is crazy she was sexually assaulted but she had to keep proving it over and over again and that's just wrong. Whereas I had kind of the opposite problem where I had to keep convincing people that I actually was okay and that what happened to me didn't completely define me and I shouldn't be like the good Indian woman and be dead because that's better than being raped. So we kind of, I think we both try to write our way into talking about how, like you said, context, we need context when we talk about this and that we, even though we wrote really personal books, they're both really political because even you are raped by individuals, but then after that you get fucked by the system, <laughs> you know. So, um, and I love her book and I love her, so I'm really excited. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so now we're going to read a little bit from each other's books. Um, I want to begin with a few like founding principles of Sohaila's book. She said, um, talks about the piece she wrote, the op-ed for the New York Times, and she said, the piece I wrote was a distillation of many of the ideas in this book. The idea that rape doesn't have to define you, that it doesn't have to reflect on your family, that it is terrible but survivable, that you can go on to have a joyous life, and that four men on a mountainside don't have to own you forever. Um, so I love those as sort of founding principles for our talk. And something I love about Sohaila's writing is the way she talks about living with trauma and how many people think of it as something that's really intense and heavy, like survivors walk around with a giant rain cloud over their heads. And she speaks about it more as something that's far more quiet and sort of lives in you and is just sort of irritating and like a bit of a bummer. And um, sort of all these little triggers you might live with. And she says, you know, talking about the anniversary of the rape, she has a sinking feeling. She talks about it being tedious and energy sapping. And that speaks so much more realistically to living with this kind of experience. Um, she said, other people say trauma is always highly colored, but sometimes the reality is closer to the opposite, a draining of color, a detraction from living fully and an enslavement to weird patterns, which are the triggers. Um, so I'd like to read this paragraph where she talks about, speaks to what survivors live with. And she says, 
Imagine what would be unleashed if so many people didn't have to waste so much time dealing with flashbacks, secret keeping, suicidal thoughts, low self-esteem, crippling fear of everything, and on down the dreary list. Imagine the fantastic, the amazing, the mind-boggling things so many rape survivors could do, say, create, or be if they didn't have to waste time being traumatized and stymied and made small. Imagine the art that we could create, the songs we would sing, the forests we could plant, the life-changing, planet-saving gizmos we could invent instead of wasting our time trying to stop our hearts from pounding if we hear footsteps behind us on our way to the bus stop. It's such a wholesale waste of potential. So next time you hear or read anything about how men who rape shouldn't have their lives fall apart because of a few minutes, stop in your tracks, howl with outrage, and then go do something joyful. So the part I loved is that the call to action in this piece is to ultimately go do something you enjoy. And I feel like at this point in my life, my book has been out for a year, and I have been actively seeking out and executing art projects. And I keep doing interviews where people say, will you still be an activist? When will you return to the activism space or keep speaking to survivors? And I don't think of it as shifting out of that realm. I think of it as a continuation. So first I conquered the story of the assault, the story that was given to me. I made it mine. But now it's time to conquer my actual story, what I feel like I'm, as Chanel, am here to do. And so I feel like for many survivors, your duty is actually to execute what brings you joy. And when you see other survivors doing that, doing something that's completely theirs, and not related to their cases, that in itself is a form of activism and is very powerful. So I'll be doing little doodles because that's my way of continuing this work. Should I do the other? Yeah, do okay. it. <laughs> okay, and then I'm gonna read a piece from Sohaila's last chapter. Okay, this chapter is called The Full Catastrophe. And she starts out with a quote from Virginia Woolf that says, I meant to write about death, only life came breaking in as usual. When I was 13 years old, my younger brother and I went on a trip during which someone gave us two large Saras crane eggs. Crane eggs. We bought them home and presented them to our father with full faith that he would hatch them, and he did. The crane who survived Hattie lived with us for years. From the first day when she emerged as a golden ball of fluff, she imprinted on my father. He was her parent, her partner, her everything. When she was full grown and almost as tall as us, Hattie and he would whoop and call to each other and race back and forth across the garden, flapping their wings in a wild mock mating dance. What is this story doing in a book about rape? Isn't it obvious? Here is madness and magic in the world. Here is the possibility of understanding across species. So why not within species? Here is the possibility of connection, of kindness, of illogical love. When Manasa Bradley, she refers to someone's story earlier in the book, walks into a room to give a talk, he often begins by saying, Hi, I'm Manasa. I was raped and I'm happy. I'm not happy that I was raped, but I'm happy. He explained to me that it's very important for him to, ha to do this. He went through years of pain, gave up, on having thousands of, gave up on having children because he felt he wasn't whole enough, spent thousands of dollars on therapy, and now his life is good. When you hear people talk about rape, they say, oh my God, his life is ruined, he told me. Who wants to hear that? I know what he means. Everyone pays a price, but not everyone gets to come out the other end with some measure of joy. Life exalts us, and life damages us. Some people are destroyed by rape. Most are not. They come through it, they go on, wearing with great dignity a mantle of bitter grace. But they shouldn't have to, and they certainly shouldn't have to do it alone. My mother didn't want me to get a job as a rape crisis counselor after college. 
Anything but that, she said, worried that I would spiral downwards after successfully putting my experience behind me. I got the job anyway, and one of the best things about those years at the Women's Center was my mother. We all looked forward to her visits. She would drive up in the afternoon after work and climb up the blue wooden steps, knitting in one hand, pound cake in the other. She made herself comfortable on the sofa while rape victims called, battered woman appeared, the phone rang with one problem after the other, and the demented cat with furious eyes raced up and down the steps. She just sat and knitted. She was there, a benign witness. It's impossible to express what that meant to everyone there. Someone who brought us cake and just sat there, knitting implacably against fear and horror and isolation. She was our witness. Zorba the Greek called the totality of life the full catastrophe. Dancing cranes, mango season, love, music, moonrise, decay, violence, all of it, the full catastrophe. Rape is part of it, but I cannot, will not accept that it is inevitable. Rape is a choice. Rapists choose to rape. The rest of us choose how we react. I don't care if I'm a mad dreamer, but I think a world without rape is possible. Thank you. I loved what you pick, and it was really strange and moving to hear somebody else read my words. Um, so let me tell you about Chanel's book. If you haven't read it, just buy it immediately. It, it, it is so beautiful. It's just the most beautiful piece of writing. And it's also, I, I was just really blown away by the story. And, but I also was blown away by the craft. And that's why I knew I had to meet you. Because, you know, she's writing about this terrible thing. But she's like me, where if you're a writer, you're going to write. So it just happens that this happened to be our subject for these books. I mean, I was thinking last night, if I'd been in a plane crash, I'd, be, I'd have written a book about air traffic safety. So while we are really connected to our issues, we're also really connected to our craft. That feeling very much from her book, there's a section where she talks about, we talk about a couch in somebody's office and how it looked like it was sculpted out of earwax. You know, like that's just, that's just gorgeous. So I, I loved it. And it also, her pacing, the way she wrote, about the trial, about how she woke up and discovered what had happened to her was really, it was like reading a horror story. And I think the thing that this book made me, reminded me the most of I, is I have a chapter in my book called Your Rape is Worse Than Mine. And I had this feeling throughout the whole book. And even when we first met and talked, it was like to her, in fact, you even mentioned at some stage in the book, somebody talking about gang rapes in India and yours wasn't as bad. But I am one of the gang rapes in India, and in my eyes, what happened, like it just seemed to me like yours was way worse. So it's kind of a stupid thing we do, but we do do it, because to, for me, the big trauma years later was flashbacks and all that, but I knew what had happened to me. And the fact that Chanel had no memory of what had happened to her, to me seemed so horrible and so awful that I couldn't... So it, it made me realize that all these things we have these thoughts we have in our heads about rape, I have, I have all the same ones. And it, it was just really moving to read this book. So I'm going to read two sections. Wait. I'm going to intervene Go and ahead. read from her book to speak to exactly what she was just saying. Hey. Um, because, you know, <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's like you do interviews and you're like, all these things I've already said but better in the book. That was really well said. But you also <laughs> write it really well. So... Okay, when you experience something firsthand, you know its colors and smells and the full horror of the hands pulling off your shoes, but you also know the limits of your pain and suffering. You don't have to wonder. And reality, no matter how bad, is more manageable than unknown horror. I know I survived what happened to me. No matter how bad it was, here I am. Here's the East River flowing outside my window. Here's a bowl of pomegranate seeds, deeply, joyously red. So I think that's really true. I think for when you're experiencing it, you know the limits of your suffering, like you said, but for anyone around you or who loves you, they don't know how yeah. bad it is and think the worst all the time. Um. Okay. So here's the first section I'm going to read. And this was not only gorgeously written, but it, 
it reminded me of a section in my own book which I think I can't bear to read. It's the one thing I cannot read because it's about the change that happens that you just don't, you don't want to think of and we all have this change. We all go through trauma and then something is lost and no matter how well we do, it can never be found. Which is why I have to say that I'm very much a proponent of compassion and kindness and I feel a certain amount of compassion for the people who raped me. But whenever I think about the guy who raped you, I just want to slug him. I just, I, I just, I can't, I can't bear it. I can't think about the three month prison sentence. I feel so excited when I think of his family seeing your book in the bookstore. So it's, thank you for giving me permission to feel that way. <laughs> All right. Um, my ability to doze off used to be a point of pride. When I'd studied abroad in China in college, everyone complained about how the maintenance men had woken them up to fix the air conditioning units above the beds. I said, they didn't fix mine. But my roommate said, there'd been men in mint green jumpsuits, boots balanced on my bedside table while I snored below. It was funny at the time, but now this terrifies me. When I find out female friends live in studio apartments, I'm in shock. But who's your witness? Who's going to protect you from all the any things that can happen? Don't you understand that alone they'll never believe you? I try to imagine that sort of life. Coming home alone, cooking pasta with a glass of Riesling, watching TV, yawning, brushing my teeth and calling it a day. I envy those who live unguarded. I remember skinny dipping in college. My greatest fear at the time was that the water was going to be too cold. Five or six of us, boys and girls, would escape the cliffside apartment parties to trot down the wooden stairs to the lumpy sand, bath towels stung, slung over our shoulders. We'd pluck our heads out of our shirts, weaving arms out of sleeves, returning to the way we were when we were born. We threw our clothes on mossy boulders as we sprinted toward the glassy water. Mel and I threw our heads back, shrieking and laughing. Seaweed lassoed and slimed around our ankles, and we picked it up and draped it across each other's shoulders like glossy scarves. We padded out to where the water was calm and deep, our heads bobbing on the surface, which shimmered in moonlight as if littered with tin foil. When skinny dipping, there was only the expanse of sky, open sea, and a circle of pure white moon. The lighting was soft, the landscape limitless. The penises nothing more than noodle shapes, breasts like mounds of silly putty. We all looked funny and natural and free. These were the greatest nights, taking turns standing beneath the hot shower and piling, sand piling around the drain making quesadillas, wearing old t-shirts, wrapped in worn blankets, huddled three to a bed like bears in a den. We'd fall asleep at four in the morning, our clothes crusted with salt, sand caked in the curves of our ears, wet hair soaking into pillows. I remember all of it warmly, but don't know how to do it again. <laughs> One night, Lucas and I were driving home from Southern California, passing through Santa Barbara. I asked him to pull off the highway, an exit I hadn't taken in three years. We parked and I let him down the wooden stairs to stand at the edge of the water. It was just as beautiful as I'd remembered, but it wasn't mine anymore. I looked left and right at the long stretches of dark shore I couldn't see into and wondered how I could have been so loud and naked, drawing attention to myself. The vulnerability of bare skin it would have been too easy to hurt me. There wouldn't have been any time to resist. No clothes to pull. If something had happened, no one would have believed me. Well, weren't you naked to begin with? Drunk on the beach at night? What did you think would happen? It wouldn't have been enough to say, I just wanted it to be me, some friends and the sea. There is a certain carefree feeling that was stripped from me the night of the assault. How to distinguish spontaneity from recklessness? How to prove nudity is not synonymous with promiscuity? Where's the line between caution and paranoia? This is what I'm mourning. This is what I do not know how to get back. Still, I keep those memories close and remember it is possible to be naked amongst men and not 
and not be asking for it. The girl running arms wide into the ocean is gone. In her place is a woman wrapped in two coats, staring at the black water, mistaking lumps of seaweed for dormant bodies, the stones for crouching men. Lucas takes my hand and asks if I'd like to walk, and I shake my head, trotting back up the wooden stairs. I found a list sifting through the transcripts that I was not meant to see. This is the transcripts of the rape case. Three pages, descriptions of photographs that have been submitted for evidence. And then there's a long list of very specific photographs that I simply cannot bear to read. My body divided into squares, put up on the large projector. For the judge and Brock and his brother and his father and every reporter and stranger in that room to see. And while this was happening, I must have been down the hall, smoothing out my blouse in the bathroom mirror, tamping down my hair with water, trying to look presentable. The humiliation I feel now for walking in oblivious and smiling. Knowing this makes me want to swallow a match, lighting my insides on fire, my stomach a red dripping cave, smoke pouring out my eyes, my ears and nose and eyes until I become crusty and hollow a black empty shell. Okay. So it's 6.35. Okay. All right. Well, I still need to read this thing. So <laughs> you just have to have questions yeah, because, no yeah. Um, so the second piece I'm going to read about her is about, it's a description of the time that Chanel wrote her victim statement. And it's so, it resonated so well with me because I remember the first time I wrote about my, it was before the story or, no, it was after my published piece, but I sat down one night, a couple years after it happened, and I just wrote, I think, maybe about 28 pages, like you, just the whole story from beginning to end, what happened, and there was a certain feeling for about that, and Chanel has described that here. I had told my story many times, but with loved ones, I told censored versions. In court, I could only speak through questions others asked me. I took out my worn copy of Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, which had guided me through college. She wrote, Remember that you own what happened to you. You cannot write out of someone else's dark place. You can only write out of your own. For the first time, I would be telling my version of the story. A letter from me to Brock. That night, I told myself, you are going to sit down and you are going to feel all of it. Dark, nasty things are going to crawl out of you. Images will reappear. The feeling of uncertainty and isolation you had at each stage will be felt again. You will feel sick. You will feel afraid. Oh, I missed. You feel sick, you will feel sad. This will not be fun. This will feel impossible, but it will be done. It must be done. The present version of myself would walk through a long, dark tunnel to meet the girl who woke up on the gurney, join hands, and begin the walk back through the timeline of horrible memories as she slowly learned the truth. As I typed, my face scrunched up. Often I spoke out loud. Sometimes the skin on my neck tightened. I whispered. I yelled. My eyes blurred with tears. I seethed. I stood up. I slumped in my seat. I walked in circles. But the two selves in my head continued to walk and walk. My present self constantly reminding my past self not to stop and curl up, just to walk through. I wrote all the way up to the present, and then I stopped. Past self and present self hugged, and past self disappeared. It was 7 a.m., and in nine hours, I had written 28 incoherent pages, my first draft. I looked out my window, the sun rising. I looked over at Lucas, sleeping peacefully. I ate some Lucky Charm cereal in my pajamas, listening to my spoon clinking against the bowl in the silence, the diluted yellow sun coating the buildings. I could see a bus down below, a small rectangle pulling up to its stop, people crossing the street. Another day was beginning. I was okay. The story had not swallowed me.
So we were going to chat, but it's like 20 minutes to seven. So should we just see if there are questions? Yeah, we can see if yeah. there are questions. Anybody? Nobody? There's a question. Yes. Did you guys discuss uh, which pieces, which parts that you would prefer the other one not read out loud? Did you have any discussion about that? Yeah. A little bit, okay. yeah. But we let each other choose generally and then had veto power. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Is everybody doing all right? <laughs> this is a really difficult time. I, I personally love being read to. I find it really soothing and it's been so long since I've just been in a room letting words come in. I've gone to a lot of book readings over Zoom, but you're like cooking and you kind of come in and out and then you just X out at the end. So I think it's really, it's just reminding me how powerful stories are and how nice it is to absorb things collectively. Um, so if anything, I hope you've come away with that feeling tonight that we've all like been able to soak in something for a little bit um, rather than being in our own apartments. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could each talk for a minute or two about the response from readers. What came for? Um, yeah, I've I've had the most outrageous two years because I've, I still, and the book came out in, it, the first edition came out in October, almost two years ago. And since then, I still constantly get emails from people who say, I've never told anyone this happened to me. So that's been really great. And, I, and actually, it's interesting because the first time when I read Chanel's book and met Chanel, I actually understood that feeling for the first time because I felt like somebody else had written what I feel. And that's a really nice feeling, but I hadn't, I hadn't seen it from that point of view. So it's been great. I, I mean, I've been all over the world and constantly been surprised by people's reactions and very much aware of my own biases. Like I, I expected to be kind of shunned and vilified in India and had the opposite reaction where I was really met with open arms by lots of people, especially young men, who were the people I thought would be the most resistant. So it's just, it's been an amazing adventure for me. Now and as the language editions come out, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I was getting ready to go public a year ago, my family and I were basically preparing for battle and I was somewhat dreading it. We were busy installing video cameras and really preparing for the worst and only slowly over the past year have I learned to sort of realize I'm gonna be okay and begin celebrating and actually get to talk about writing and not be on guard all the time. So that's been really nice is just like being able to trust the world again. I also find that like so many people are so protective of me, which has been like insane and amazing to witness um, so thank you. And um, again, with the passage I read about Sohaila's mom coming to the rape crisis center and simply knitting, I thought that was really powerful because she called her the benign witness. And I had a fear that I would need to become this person who could heal people and who would have the answers to your stories when you come to me. And I, I just don't have that. And I have a very limited capacity because I'm just a human but I realize that when I'm doing these signings and I'm sitting at the table usually that presence is enough and most people just need to speak their stories in order to set them down like you don't even have to wrangle them you don't have to fix them but as long as you've created a space so that it's no longer locked in them and can just kind of float out and they can leave the event a little lighter then I think you've done something great and I also think a lot about success. I think people are kind of daunted by these stories sometimes. They're like, whoa, this is too much. I don't know what to do. I don't know exactly how to help you. But just being there and providing presence is really important. So don't underestimate your ability to do that, to show up for people. Um, I, I want to just add to that and say it's been really interesting for me to read Chanel's book and get to know her and sort of think about how this whole business of going public 
has been so different for the two of us because partly because of the time difference with internet and all that and because your story you were public and private at the same time in this really weird way for a long time you were Emily Doe but only four people or whatever knew that this was you so you were public and private in this bizarre way and then you had to kind of bring them together so and with the court case as well it felt very much like your struggle was one of trying to react to this stuff being thrown you didn't always have control about who knew what when and to me that's really that's frightening and i admire you for being able to get through that i i had much more control about the one time that i felt like i lost control when the thing went global i quickly grabbed it back by writing but i i can't imagine what that must have been like and i wonder sometimes about that moment that moment when you went from private public to fully public that must have been terrifying I actually, that day, I had to fly to Santa Barbara for an interview with Oprah. And so I was like, all I was thinking about was what I was going to say. I was like, I don't care what happens to me. I just need this next few hours to go all right. So I was like in the airport reading self-help books, trying to find like nuggets of wisdom, thinking about like what I could say that she doesn't already know. <laughs> the executive producer said that I had something to offer because I'm like, in a new generation that doesn't hold as much shame. So I was like, okay, I guess we'll talk about that. But <laughs> my, I, I was getting all these texts from people from my high school, like, oh my God, I'm so sad. They were like devastated. I was like, please don't talk to me. I'm very busy. I'm trying to focus for this interview. So that's, that's the truth. <laughs> There's one. Go ahead. So systemically, I still think it's quite depressing, and I think we have a long way to go, and it changes much slower. I, I focus a lot more on personal individual experiences and confidence, because that's where I know I can have some effect. And something that's interesting to me about rape is that if a man rapes a woman, we treat it like the ball's in her court now. So if she reports, we kind of say the ball's in your court, you can either say something and mess up his life or just keep the ball indefinitely. And it's much safer and easier if you just hold on to that ball. And that's always bothered me. And I feel like I do my work so that she knows she's supposed to pass it back. She's supposed to pass that ball to us because it's not her job to figure this out on her own and to try and protect all the people around her. She needs to, the quicker she can realize that it's not her job alone to carry that burden and to make all these decisions that will affect other people, um, that's what I try and work on. And so what bothers me most about what happened to me and what happens to a lot of other young women is how much my confidence dwindled, how much I was not creating, how much I love drawing but stopped drawing, all those things really bother me and make me angry today. And so if I can wake up in someone, if I can get them out of shame more quickly so that they can resume their lives, that to me is successful. So I try and focus on, uh, it's really hard. I, I do get frustrated with how little control I have over outcomes and accountability, but I do have control speaking to the victim directly and trying to get her to a place where she feels more centered and confident with her story so that she can carry on. And that's, that's what I feel like I can do now. 
And I, <laughs> I'm just thinking about your question of are things better? And I sort of, the optimist in me wars with the realist, battles with the realist who, I don't know. I don't know because it also, I think it also depends on who are you asking that question to and for. For instance, you can ask, you can look at the Me Too movement and say, yes, there's progress because for the first time in the history of us, people are talking about these stories openly. People are saying these things. There are some consequences, not as many as many men would have you believe, but there are some. People are people are aware and you're not, no one now in this world, no one with an internet connection can be like I was at 17, where I thought I was the only person on earth ever to have been raped. And I felt completely alone because there was no possibility that this could, so that has changed, yes. But then, is there less rape? I don't know. I don't think so. Is there less domestic violence? Is there less sexism? It seems to me that if you look around at the world, right now we're going through a period of a lot of kind of political and personal disrespect. And I think rape is really rooted in disrespect. It's a manifestation of one human being or one group of human beings feeling like, you know, this other group deserves us to just maraud. And so I'm just not sure if things are, I think things are better when you look at certain pockets. I think it's fantastic that Chanel and I both came out publicly. We're sitting here, we're talking, people are interested. We're not being, you know, stoned by a gang of people. That's great. That might not have happened a long time ago. But I'm not so sure. I feel like, yes, there's the victim perspective, and that's fantastic. And I hope that I've done that too for some people. But I feel like, you know, the bottom line is people are raping people, and that's what needs to stop. And that's still happening. So I, I, it's kind of a mixed answer. I think we made some progress, but I don't think we've made nearly as much work. But I still believe that we could have a world without rape because we can, if we can have our own pockets of people who respect each other, why can't we somehow transmit that? I, I don't think it's impossible. I don't think there's enough of a will to do it. I don't think people care enough. It's, it's this whole thing of either you're dead because it's so bad or it's not such a big deal. And we, we can't seem to be getting around that. Sorry to be a downer. But. <laughs> Um, last summer, I met them for the first time in New York City, and they had flown in for the 60 Minutes interview. We had never, it's been over five years, we'd never met because we were all considered witnesses and couldn't watch each other testify. Um, we ordered calamari, we had a great time. When they were interviewed about how it felt to meet me, they said it felt like meeting family, which made me burst into tears. Um, and then I just wrote an afterword for the paperback, and and I mentioned how when I was speaking to them, one of them said that he had regret, and I was like, for what? And he's like, because I didn't come five minutes sooner. And I was like, what? I was like, you're already the saviors of the story. Like, you're the only people who did everything right, and you still wish for a different outcome. And then I just realized, like, no matter what, all of us sort of grapple with what if things we're different and we have all these if only scenarios and at the end of the day all we have is this like this is it this is what we've been given and this is what we need to deal with and so it helped me sort of accept like at the end of the day we can't change anything that happened but this is the story and it's it's sort of a beautiful story um looking around at where i am now um so we had such a good time it was so fun and then I still email them and show them like what I'm doing and they're like, we love it, we'll always be on your team. So, they're amazing. And I have to add to that and say that this is why, this is why I believe that there's hope because it's not, I mean, Chanel and I, there are many differences in our story but one of the things we have in common is that we both have fantastic supportive families and friends and for both of us, many of the heroes of our story are men. And so, how do you, you can't just write off men and say they're all these beasts, these raping beasts, but they're, you know, they're, it sort of makes you realize that there's a choice people make and many people choose to be 
good and decent. And these, I mean, the Swedes, I wrote about them in my book. Yeah. They're so fantastic. They, they, the fact that they chased him and caught him, it's great. It's like, a, there needs to be a movie, you know? So all these things exist. We have goodness and we have badness. And I, I, I cannot bring myself, even though I look around and I feel filled with horror at the world, I cannot bring myself to let go of the reality that there is so much goodness and that we both, we're both sitting here today having written these books and having all these experiences. Not, but there's nothing special about getting raped. But there's something really special about what support you get, what you do with it later. And, and neither of us is here on her own. And there are plenty of people sitting here who are part of that. So if they're here, they're all over. Woo! Like, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But um, before, I, and you guys are going, we're going to talk some more. But before, um, any, if anybody wants any signed books at the store, the store is closed now at seven. But both Chanel and Talia were kind enough to go sign some books for us, and we have a, a place on the website that you can order signed copies. So when you go to the event page, you can just pick the, choose the option to order a signed copy if you don't have a signed copy. So, all right. So continue. I think, uh, I think it's seven. Um, so my family's actually here except for my sister. So you guys, you good? Mom, dad, yeah, <laughs> they're pretty good. Um, and my sister, I, I love that you asked that. I struggled a lot with this idea that I've said before the victim is sort of held at like the pinnacle of pain, the one who is suffering the most and needs the most resources. And I don't think that's always true. And a lot of what the past few years have been has sort of, you know, once you're out of the case and all that focus on just getting the verdict is relieved, I think it's really important to assess the damage that the people around you have endured in supporting you. And I think it's really difficult for the supporters to ask for help because they don't want to divert attention to themselves. And so when I do these speaking things, I try and like promote the helpers to go get help because it's just as important. And I think I don't, I am the physical body that endured the assault but the assault itself was psychologically and emotionally experienced by like all the people who love me and surrounded me. And I think it was our experience and we all had to figure out how to come out of it together. And we all have our own versions of the story. And it's really important for you to honor that version you've had, honor the damage that's been done and think about how you've changed. Um, and then treat it like a constant conversation. My sister and I are always checking in with each other. Um, and just, you know, is something coming up for you again? You know, or we, I notice residual pieces of this whole story in the way we still communicate. But um, yeah, we just started like a podcast in quarantine. She mailed me a microphone and the entire podcast is talking about ridiculous elements of childhood and nothing more. And every week we get dozens of emailed submissions of people telling us their childhood stories and that's all we do. And I think it's really important that we protect space to continue to just be ourselves independent of everything that's happened. Well, I did a very clever thing because my book is not just about me. So I can pick what I want to talk about. But the thing is that when I wrote the book, 
I made up my mind because people said, well, it might be traumatic to go on a book tour, it might be traumatic to do events and talk about it. And I just decided that as long as it, I'm enjoying it, I'll do it and then I'll stop. And I, I didn't expect, because I think it's also different, mine was a long, much longer time ago. Like when I, you're six years out. At six years out, I was still having nightmares and flashbacks and I, I don't know if I could have done it. But now it's a, it's a you know, it's a, it's a lifetime ago. And so I wasn't so much afraid of being traumatized about my own situation, but I, I know this sounds awful, but I was really afraid of being bored. I thought, I'm, I, you know, enough of this. I'm, I'm going to, how much can I keep on talking about rape? And then I thought, well, the minute I get bored, I'm going to stop. And the thing that really surprised me is I never got bored because every event is completely different. Every story is different. The, you talk about rape and sexual assault, you're talking about everything else as well. So I'm, I'm still going on because I'm not bored, but it didn't, it, I think, the, I had enough distance from it by the time the book came out that, but there have been moments, for sure. I was, I had this crazy, since we're not on TV and all, I can say this. I had this crazy thing when I went to India. I was so afraid. I had this, even though it was, you know, 35 years later, I, I could hear the guys who raped me in my head saying, if you ever tell anyone, we will kill you. And I, I would have these dreams about going to the literature festival and these guys rising up from the audience and, and doing something. It was just this completely crazy, scary thing. And then it didn't happen and it went. So one has one's moments, but, but generally it's been okay. But I think it's probably very different for you. Yeah, I, I think I've come a long way in that when I was testifying, I couldn't talk about what happened without having a full-blown panic attack and having to be excited. And now I can talk about it in like a creepily calm way and like smile through it all and like never shed a tear. Um, but I, but there's still a lot of emotional potency in the story. It's just that the center of that emotion has shifted. I actually, when I talk about um, the stories I hear and meeting people, I often cry um, because it's so moving to me and it's, inexplicable in some ways and so amazing. It's hard for me to talk about that without crying. Um, I think it's interesting, so Hyla read the skinny dipping part of my book as particularly heartbreaking. And the section that you don't want to read in your book, I thought it was going to be a really graphic section, and when I turned to it, it's about walking home during sunset, worried someone was yeah, behind you. Yeah, and so I think it's really fascinating, like, now what feels heartbreaking maybe it's not the assault itself but it's sort of like taking inventory of what's been lost and that can hit you in different ways so again with any type of trauma or loss i think it's really important to assess like year by year how it's hitting you or like how it's informing what you're doing or how it what emotions are manifesting because i think I think it'll always be there, but it changes. It's changed so much. So the case is sort of like, eh. It's, not, it's, it's really not that interesting to me anymore. And I feel like anytime I'm asked about it, I'm like, you can go on Wikipedia. Like, for me, what's far more interesting is story and craft and, like, syntax and um, narrative. And I could talk about that forever. Well, I mean, from my gray hair, I have a a secret for you, which is that some of those things that that seem lost actually weirdly get found again. They do. So that's really great. Um, I think Lucas had a question. I actually had a very, very similar question. Um, what motivates you, uh, obviously, in all of your, your work? You, you both obviously had such a big impact. You've been so generous with, with, with your time. and. Um, wonder how much of that is is sort of social meaning or um, you know, that it's meaningful to you and how much of it is interest and, and, and really enjoy it and just what is your outlook uh, as far as how you do it? What, most, what motivates you and what's your outlook for that? That was my boyfriend. That was such a serious question. <laughs> uh, um, what motivates us Again, I go back to the confidence thing and like how much fire I feel when I see a young person doubting themselves or curling in on themselves. That really kills me and like maddens me. And I think it always 
will. And I'm always happy to show up and sort of speak against whatever force is kind of suffocating them. Um, so I'm, I'll always be there for that. And I think I'll be trying to do that through like different mediums and different stories. But I guess that if you will, when I'm older and you look at a body of work, that will probably be the like common thread throughout. Um, and, and for me, I think, you know, from the first, I long ago, I used to work at a rape crisis center. And it was, the, it was very much what Chanel said before, is you don't have to do anything. You just have to be there for people to listen. So that part's been really great. But for me, it's a different, the focus is somehow different. It's about the world. I think I've spent my life very indignant that questions of rape and sexual assault are considered women's issues. Because I don't think it's a women's issue at all. If anything, it's a man's issue. But I think it's everyone's issue. And I felt this burning need to produce something that, and I think your book is this way too. It's a book for everyone. And it, it's a conversation starter for everyone. And I really felt like I, I had spent 30 years with this thing in my head and having this thought and that thought and the other thought. And I'd spent 30 years being a writer. And suddenly it seemed like it was the moment to put these things together and really work really hard to craft something that I could come in front of any audience and, and really make them think and make them feel. And so it's the thing that keeps me going is I love stuff like this, especially like after six months of not doing it. I love the fact that people care enough about this issue or about us or anything, whatever, to show up and think about it. And then if almost every single event I've gone to all over the world, someone has come up and said, this happened to me or this happened to my loved one. Thank you for making, thank you for bringing it up. And so it's very, it's, it's, you say generous, it doesn't feel generous, it feels almost greedy. Like I have gotten so much more than I feel I've given. everybody stay safe and floating around each other <laughs> gently <laughs>